Hey, savages. Welcome to Greg Medford Show. Greg, your host here, Phoenix, Arizona. So um, we've just had primaries, midterm primaries here in Arizona, and we've got a wave of folks, new folks, America First folks, mama bears, and the like, moving their way through the system towards our uh, midterm election. We've got a guest in today. We're going to talk. Everyone has been talking about, all right, so when the 2020 election went down the way it did, Everybody said, what can we do? And the Trump people, very wisely, they said, go get involved in your school boards. Go get involved at the local level in, in the goings-on of your community. And there's a whole new wave of people who are jumping into this crazy game. And it's because while we've all been raising kids and earning living, earning a living and, and being responsible citizens... Ne'er do wells have infected our country, and they're really on this long game. And you guys have heard me talk about this. We we have a tendency in politics to play whack a mole. We've got our our national representatives in both the House and Senate arguing over guns and abortion and this, that, and the other, and they argue about things that substantively are annoying to us, but don't maybe ruin the country at its core instantly and it's because they 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 obfuscate life with these things that they're annoying you know the people who are the most radical about abortion are crazy vagina hat wearing lesbians and old ladies who can't have babies they're the nuts about it and in the middle the rest of america has got when polled a huge amount of agreement so we're going to get to shake that all out that's one nutty thing the gun thing surprisingly there's a great amount of unity over the firearm thing in the united states but they're gonna get in a big squabble over that so that we all fight about these liberties and while that's going on while we have these little whack-a-mole games they are stealing our children's minds for 20 years they get them in kindergarten preschool and they start in many places they're doing it right now and that many places they're getting blocked and it turns into a big Donny Brook. And w so what happens is they go, all right, well, we're going to take some wins and losses on the Second Amendment. We're going to take some wins and losses on abortion. But in 20 years, the kids are coming and they're going to be Marxists and we're going to win the war. So they engage us in these little skirmishes. And it is distraction for the big war. And the big war, and I hate to say this because this is what everybody says when they want your money. It's for the children. That's what Nancy Pelosi, it's for the children. If one children is hurt, it's worth spending a trillion dollars. If just one children is one child is left behind. And while we have that silly argument about whack-a-mole issues in this country, they're propaganda propagandizing our kids from a very early age all the way to the end. And so for conservatives like myself, I'm in a constant battle and I have these I have to have this very smooth, articulate, easy way with my 16-year-old daughter to make sure she's a right-headed American. Not a conservative. I'm not work I'm not trying to program her into anything. I don't want to brainwash and propagandize her either. But I want her thinking for herself. I'm proud of her as a young woman, thinking for herself and fighting through the issues. The school doesn't want that anymore. They're not even teaching the issues. What they're teaching is their perspective on a solution to brainwash away the issue, which is batshit crazy. So we're going to talk about today. Um, this is going on in your town. If you're in Marin County, if you're in Bergen County, if you're in... Springfield, Missouri, or Massachusetts, doesn't matter if you're in Tallahassee, Florida, Lukenbach, Texas, or Phoenix, Arizona, or Scottsdale, like we're going to talk about today. This is going on. It is the exact same people. Um, there's a great video I saw on YouTube a couple days ago, and it was the, f the five signs of a brainwashed lunatic, and one of them are the eyes. They got those crazy ah, kind of pie-eyed madness about them and i see this when i talk to people about this gender stuff this all of the things we're seeing uh thrown our, our kids in school so 
I've been kind of quietly battling this with logic and reason and consistency for years with my kids, and it seems to have worked. But it's almost a full-time engagement, and clearly I'm a lunatic. Um, today, uh, our guest is Corinne Werner. She is running for Scottsdale Unified School District School Board, and she is one of the, uh, we'll see, are you a mama bear? Would you say you're a mama bear? Absolutely. So she's a mama bear who's been woken up by the shit show we've seen over the last couple of years, probably emboldened by the don't say the the uh, the don't say gay bill that got passed in Florida, and what happened with Disney. All of that, and we start seeing our institutions flip on us, and we wonder what the hell's going on. So yes. welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You know, the audience, you know, on the other side of the door, they're, they're an unruly lot. If I, if I, shush up now. But they all listen really well. That's great. Um, did you run unopposed? No, I'm not running opposed, unopposed. W for the primary though? No, so we, it, the school board races are nonpartisan. So. Oh, <laughs> that's super funny. Well, and the school boards have become very partisan, and we've allowed that to happen by not paying attention to who was running for our school boards for the last 20-something years. And uh, we've allowed, uh, the, unapologetically, the uh, left has moved into our school boards. Okay. So, and as we're seeing in, in Scottsdale, so we have three current board members who uh, ran on being on the left, and they will say they're on the left now. So, um, you know, we need to... Well, we really need to shift um, the what's going on there so that we can have a we can really focus on education and academics, which is why we send our kids to school so that they can learn reading, writing, math, and so on, and um, not be distracted by all of the gender and pronouns and and all this um, social justice warriors. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? So I'm an immigrant. I, um, I arrived here at 11 years old. Three weeks later, I stepped into a public school Where are you classroom. From? I'm from Norway. Okay. And uh, um, we left because my dad was taxed 90% of his income, which is why, you know, it looks like we're headed that way here now. Yep. So um, uh, I'm a product of public school. And where'd you grow up here? Um, so I spent a lot of time in Washington and uh, in Nevada. And then we moved here about 10 years ago. And uh, and you've got kids, married with children. Yep. Give me give me the break. Married, give us a little breakdown. Married twenty seven years, and uh, three kids. And my youngest just graduated from Scottsdale Unified. So I've had three kids go through the Scottsdale Unified schools, and uh, it's been really astonishing to me to see the difference in how our kids are being educated. So my daughter is eight years older than my youngest, mm -hmm. and when she graduated from Chaparral. It was very much merit based. You did your work, you produced grades, and that's what reflected on your report card and so on. There was not all of this um, social engineering going on. There was not a focus on sexuality clubs or pronouns or anything like that. And with my youngest just graduating in May, uh, I did notice about 2018 would have been his freshman year. He came home saying he didn't have to have the same values and traditions as his family does. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. And this is what he's learning in school, right? Right. And you're and you're like, what fucking government raised lackey told you that? I mean, he didn't probably say that quite the I way. did not use those words, but I think my head snapped <laughs> when I heard that. Yeah. And uh and so it took a it took a lot of conversations and now we're I, I'm I'm a conservative. I came here during the Reagan years and so um I believe in, you know, constitutional principles in American exceptionalism. Everybody wants to come to America. Mm -hmm. I mean that's just a fact. Yeah. They may not tell if they're in a big group, they may not say that, but I know individually if somebody has the opportunity to come here, they're gonna come. So e even from petrochemical welfare states like Norway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny, most Americans don't know much about Norway. They just think it's this wonderful place of tall blonde people. And yeah, it's beautiful. a petrochemical welfare state. It is. People don't realize that they got all their fans and they got all their windmills and they got all this. They also have a bunch of oil that they're drilling out in the ocean. That's what they pay for their infrastructure with. That's correct. They sell their oil to everybody else and drive electric cars. Hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. So, um, and so with what I started seeing back in 2018 and, and with my youngest going through um, was the shift in the things that it wasn't 
focused on academics anymore. And uh, it was definitely concerning, but we're a tight-knit family, so we have a lot of conversations. And um, being that I'm an immigrant, I'm very staunch about our American beliefs and supporting you know, the constitutional principles that we get to live by. And so there's no room for, there's no wiggle room in our home for that. And um, when COVID hit, it was a big eye opener for all of us. So I've always been involved as a parent in education. So 22 years as a parent in education. <laughs> well, you know, I was just going to say, I, you know, we're from a similar neighborhood and my kids are in PV uh, school district right across the line from you. Yep. And, you know, two well-heeled, well-to-do districts. Um, and, you know, what I, I noticed that in the last seven years, they've pushed us out of the classrooms. They have. And what was interesting is when my kids started in school, it seemed like there was so much involvement and we were so welcome around. And then the bulletproof glass and barricades came up out front. And I understand why, but I'm also, I've been calling bullshit on those for a long time. But whatever. As soon as those went up, they blocked us out completely. And it became, oh, well, we'll screen who we let in. And you go down and get your parent safety card with your thumbprint and okay, we're going to do a background check on you. I'm like, my kid's in school, man. You know, I, I want to poke in and see what's going on in this classroom. No, we don't allow disruptions during class. I go, oh, okay. So as soon as they got cloistered off, it seemed like this started. Because this has not been going, there's always been a little bit of a left bent, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly was when I was in high school. But it was still, you knew it was there, but it wasn't uh, as permeating as it is now. And and in the second grade and first grade with my kids, I didn't notice it with my daughter anyways, my older daughter. And then when something in the last seven years changed, it's like a generation of young teachers made it to the system finally teaching and they're behind closed doors and there's not much parental involvement and they screen parents so hard. Maybe they pick the people that agree with them. You know, I don't know what's going on, but it definitely seems that maybe in the last five years, it's really accelerated into this kind of craziness we're hearing about in the news all the time. Yeah, and it's, it's putting a wedge between our children and families. Yeah. And it, parents used to be welcome into the classroom because they were helping hands. They were another set of eyes and ears. And so when they started pushing at us out, particularly um, after, I think they used COVID as a big excuse for that. Yeah. But it also ramped up all of these social the social engineer, engineering, the social justice warriors just have come out in forces. And it seems like, well, it is. The the social emotional learning, the gender ideologies are just coming in like a bullet bullet train. And when I got involved with running for school board, I was actually asked to run for school board June of last year. It was never really on my forefront of, of hey, I'm going to run for school board. That was, wasn't in my plans. And uh, I'd actually, when I was asked to run, I said, well, let me go find somebody for you. So my friend and I, Amy Carney, who's running with me now, uh, we went out and we interviewed, we vetted, and we talked to as many possible great candidates that we could. And then at the end of the day, we realized it was us. And um, and so peeling back the layers and looking at how fast and how deep this agenda has made it into our schools, it's it's frightening. And so um, as an involved mom back, I've always been involved and my middle child is a is an athlete. So I was always involved with sports and fundraisers and very much hands on in the schools. So when when COVID hit and the, we were shut down, schools were on Zoom and there was no sports at all or extracurricular activities, I saw what it was doing to our kids and I ended up rallying 140 parents and launched a campaign to get our sports and extracurricular activities started again. And within 24 hours of the we launching the campaign, the, they had an emergency board meeting. And then two weeks later, they restarted the um, sports and extracurricular activities so that now the kids could come together and, you know, have some sort of normalcy and get some physical exercise and so on. Now, and actually, uh, the, the head coach of my son's program at the time told me later that, you know, had I not done that, we would not have had sports in 2020. And that's life altering for a lot of kids. So the parameters that they put on our kids to even have the sports were 
they were absolutely horrible, but at least we got that, right? So it's like um, they, they make things so hard on us as a whole. And then when, when they give a, give an inch, it's like we feel happy, like, well, at least we got a little bit. You know, it's almost like uh, the the Democrat Party has thrown seven, eight dollar a gallon gas. So at four eighty five a gallon, we feel like it's at least it's four eighty five. Exactly. Except it's four eighty five. It's nuts. But it's that's nuts. you're one hundred percent right. But what's <laughs> going on here is, you know, these school boards are unaccountable. They're not being account held to account by anybody. And most people don't know the names of the school board members when they vote. That is a fact. And so um, it is absolutely right. We have to be super engaged. Even if you don't have kids in your town, if you want a little, a bunch of little unaccountable Marxist, hippie, destructive, drug-addled, fucktard kids who are not connected to their parents or American values of responsibility and community, well, then just don't care and vote for whomever. You got to know who's there. You do. You have to take a look at who the candidates are. You got to check out their websites, email them and ask for a meeting because we need proven parent leaders who can actually get something done, who have the backbone to push back against this leftist agenda that's coming into our schools. Mm -hmm. um, right now, there's a there's a big problem with the social emotional learning, and um, it really is the gateway to bring in the cultural Marxism and, and the bad stuff. And they, what's happened is, is that social emotional learning, some people say that, oh, that was a good thing. It's for therapies and so on. But no, what they've done is um, it's tied to the federal funding. So when you accept ESTER funds, when you accept funds from the federal government, they're saying, okay, you have to teach social emotional learning. Well, that's where the, they're, um, they've really taken away from parents teaching morality teaching character teaching you know teaching your children how to be a good person and they've taken that to where it's being taught in schools but it's not being taught in schools in the way that it's about personal responsibility or uh being accepting of other people it's from that victim position it is and uh, I, you know i think the chinese are behind this absolutely i think they have come up with a way to get us to marginalize ourselves while we tear ourselves apart at the seams they build a hegemony around the planet based on making bridges and fields and buildings, you know, making soccer fields and buildings. They're, they're changing the world and we're arguing with each other about social emotional learning instead of doing math. Yeah. And another thing that's going on in the schools. And so last year, August of last year was my son's first day of school. And we had had conversations about pronouns because we don't do pronouns in our house. We just don't. It's just another way to separate people and label people. And it's just, it's not our thing. When you say you don't do pronouns, you mean you don't do non normal uh, abnormal pronouns? Okay, we're not going to identify as. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out what you mean. <laughs> all right. Because so, I mean, we use pronouns all the time. He, she, hey, he, uh, he just went right, outside. Let me, let I mean, me back you it use up. normal pronouns. We normally use normal pronouns, but we don't put a label next to our name. Like, and so I'll give you the example here. So there was a questionnaire done on the first day of my first week of class in his English class. And it was, <laughs> what is your preferred name? And does your family know? Second one was, what is your preferred pronoun? And does your family know? And the whole, clearly the my whole son question is, a, <laughs> the whole question isn't a fishing expedition. It is a fishing expedition. Yeah. And, you know, I brought it up. Um, uh, Amy Carney and I did a education event last year and I brought it up at that education event it was for parents and there wasn't a, a whole lot of traction on it. And what's interesting because, you know, younger parents are coming, you know, you're teaching your children to be kind and accepting, but that's taken on a whole new role now in a whole new world and being t kind and accepting. And so what happened is, is now the, the surveys and questionnaires have taken on a whole new meaning because now is what is your preferred pronoun and what do you want me to call you in front of other people including your parents that was oh, the question that was in, in other words what secret can we have together that you you don't want your parents to know about that's right and so it started with a simple what are your pronouns to now it's let's keep secret from your parents have you seen you know it's one of the things they do is they change the names of uh, uh, abnormal behavior they change the names of it so that when you see the name change, there's something coming. They do it every time. It's a step of normalization. Like, all right, I, I don't care about 
people being transgender or homosexual or anything like that. And I think it's something people struggle with because, uh, you know, I, because it's not mainstream and they struggle with it because maybe there's a whole spectrum of human sexuality in it and, and, and people can be in a lot of different parts of the spectrum. I, I don't think it should be part of the curriculum everywhere. And they're saying if one child is sitting here quietly, not comfortable in their skin, we need to make everybody uncomfortable in their skin. I don't think that's the way to approach it. It isn't. And it seems like that's what's going on. You know, uh, so you don't say, you don't say uh, stewardess anymore. You say flight attendant. They don't call it a cockpit. It's the flight deck. Um, there, there is uh, the renaming of things that goes on. And, uh, you know, I guess there's, there's a new name for these pedophiles. So pedophile, we know what that is. And it's wrong. It is wrong. But now they have some like, um, they have some technical name for it that strips away the awfulness of it. It's terrible. They, for a while, there was minor attracted person, what's it, right? What's it called? Adults who admire children. <gasps> yeah, yeah. No, it's got it's it's like that. Oh my um, goodness! You know, I think uh, just like uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Now, I was reading. There's another name for it. They they call them social. Uh, social infections or something like that i mean they come up with names to make things more acceptable now maybe there's some merit to that in in the medical world because it gets people to get themselves treated i suppose but they're doing it with our kids and it starts to normalize odd behavior it starts to normalize challenging behavior right when they're you know kids are trying to figure things out they don't know everything so they're it's People forget it was. It's a confusing time and it's a challenging time, and you've got your peer group around. You're trying to like, how do you fit in your, you know that that's part of molding us, right? That's part of the nurture plus what mom and dad show us. It's a confusing time to now have a bunch of little meddling furry Marxists throwing this crap at our kids. It makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, it it does. And the thing is, I have gay friends. I even know somebody who's trans and guess what that's totally fine you do people can choose to live the li their lives the way that they want and they can best self yeah be self-expressed right but you can't shove it down our children's throats do you think uh, you know i know gay people who don't want anything that's being said in public on behalf of gay people to be said do you think the trans and gay community are kind of like can you guys all you straight people stop arguing about this so and just leave us alone do you think they're have you ever asked I did. What, what was it? What was the, the response? Was one hundred percent. They what, what don't I just want. Said? But what you said, yes. They feel like their their community's been hijacked, and they don't want a part of this. Yes. Be, and and they don't want this pushed upon children. Right. So you know, I I think that this is America, and we get to live the life, live our lives so we want to live our lives, but we don't get to do what we're doing, what they're doing to children right now. And it's a big distraction. It's what I was saying at the, my opener, you know, and, and unfortunately, so the, the left has glommed on to this. And what ends up happening, it ends up making hostility with your regular straight population that is that doesn't currently exist against trans people. Because they think, oh, they must be behind, must be behind this. And I don't want anyone screwing with my kids. It, you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. create, and I think they're going. To, we didn't say this. We just want to hang out in San Francisco and Miami and do these cross dresser Liza Minnelli shows. We 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 don't want kids being taught about all this stuff, and uh, and I I know that's the case. Absolutely, I've, I know that they they don't want all of that, but the left wants that. It's a way of um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand the the, the end game. Well, it destabilizes our our society through our children yeah you know it was um when i started delving into the social emotional learning um i've done a lot of research i have worked with a lot of experts and the design was to um shock the children's values keeping them in a constant state of anxiety so that they would surrender to whatever is being taught in front of them and whoever so it's re-education it's communist re-education theory all like straight up I mean, this is what they do in yeah. this is what they do in re-education camps. Yeah, and whoever teaches a child something first becomes the expert. Mm -hmm. And you know, they spend way more time with with teachers than they do with their parents. Now, I have a lot of teachers that reach out to me, and 
they don't want this stuff either. And so they're leaving our district in droves because they don't want to be a part of this distraction and destabilizing movement. So who's making this mandatory that they teach? Because when I was around schools, teachers could leave stuff out of their curriculum all the time. So the curriculum's a huge issue and it's one of the was the one of the driving forces of had that had me get involved. So Scottsdale adopted a curriculum last year for high school. It's called Savas, used to be Pearson. And inside of that curriculum there is you know, you got to teach the curriculum. So there are assignments that are um, very uh, well. So we'll talk about list and minus real quick. That is the um, that's the current events that's inside of Savas. Think of like a big box, and inside of the box is just thousands of items that they can choose from. So uh, I and and for folks who don't have kids, and for folks who haven't been in school in a long time, some of you older folks. It used to be that teachers built their curriculum that was part of their training and that uh, principals would hire teachers and uh, the teachers would have a reputation for being the tougher or not as tough for the nicer teachers. Mm -hmm. But they had fundamentally built most of their curriculum and then your district bought books, which a lot of which were developed down in Texas, I believe. And those books were printed and distributed around the country and the textbooks became kind of almost like a keel because different curriculum would use the same textbook. Now what happens is I believe a school, if I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just trying a little backfill for folks who don't have kids currently. The schools seem like they buy these modules. A school district buys a disciplinary module, the spark. We're a spark school. And then they have these five ways that they interact with kids to try and teach right behavior. And your district pays big money to some company that has made up a disciplinary plan for a school and they put the school where a spark school. We went to a spark school. It was awful. Then they buy these curriculum packages and the curriculum package is put together by some company and, and, and then that's what's given to the teachers to teach and that's what's in Google Classroom and that's what's in... Uh, um, like PD learners and all of those, all of their big websites all interact with the curriculum a certain way. It, it, do I have this right? Digital so, tests, digital. Yeah. So they're really, there's a big push to move away from textbooks. And I reviewed, so I went to the district office, I reviewed the curriculum of both middle school and, and high school. And so you have the textbooks. The textbooks are going to look fairly benign. They're not putting things out there where you can find it easily. But then now everything ties back to something digital. So they, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic or beginning of COVID, every student in Scottsdale was issued a Chromebook. And I remember telling my kids, I'm like, you guys need a Chrome, you don't need a school issued Chromebook, you have one, just use that. No, 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 no. They had to go pick up a school issued Chromebook because that's where everything was loaded. So when, when you go to the current events or you go to the different assignments, they are now on that Chromebooks, it's digital. And so that's where the assignments are that are going to be very leftist or they're going to be, you know, right now there's a big movement of, of this um, trans agenda. So there was on Twitter, and this was also again in, in Scottsdale, where it was a third grade Chromebook, the mom opened it up and there was quizzes, am I gay? And every, third grade. Um, was that and, in Scottsdale? Yeah, in Scottsdale. And uh, I'll, I'll have to find it for you and what I'll tag you on it. But, and that has that is a huge distraction from educating our children. The reason that we send our kids to school is we want them educated in reading, writing, math, civics, and so on, so they can grow up to thrive. And um, we, we want our kids to have an equal opportunity, uh, to have an opportunity to get educated and to be able to either go to college or a trade school or jump right into business or some type of a workforce. But we want to set them up in a way that they can go out in this world and be productive members of society that hopefully stay in our community and make it better. Um, these are our future leaders. They don't need, don't need me taking a quiz of whether I'm gay in third grade. Well, you know what's crazy about it? Um, so I have a dear friend who's... Uh, Basically, his son came home and came out to him. I think it was the second grade. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, hold on a second. Where did you get all this bullshit from? And and he had like he, he had 
sophisticated vocabulary about it and defended his position. Too articulately for somebody who's never kissed a girl, who's years away from his first kiss, years away from puberty, years away from all of the things that drive us as we, you know, go through adolescence, right? Mm -hmm. And he's coming out and identifying already. And that was all loaded by the school that he was going to. And I told my friend, my friend's like, well, you know, I just, I'm going to love my son no matter what. I go, hey, listen, nobody should making sexually declarative statements in the second grade. Knock it off. Get him in a different school. Hope the academics are great. No, they're not. They're not great. I'm telling you right now. And it's over and it was over in Scottsdale. Go, it, go figure. It's you crazy. Know, you know, and we... We as parents are going to love our kids no matter what. And you know what? It's okay if the kid's gay, but who the hell knows they're gay in the second grade and has the vocabulary to back it up? I mean, it, it, what I mean is he probably took the Am I Gay quiz, answered enough questions, and he goes, oh, I guess I'm gay. And then he goes, decides he's gay, now starts identifying that way, and now tells his parents. And, and I, I think it's bananas. It is bananas, and it doesn't belong in the schools. You know, they're there for a purpose. They're not there to be indoctrinated in that way. Yeah. And and it's sad because, um, you know, you look at, let's talk about like mental health. There's a big, this mental health crisis in the schools. Well, I think parents hand the mental health crisis to our kids. It's called a phone. They open up an app every day or, you know, but um, it's, I understand part of it is very real, but part of it's also very manufactured because of what they're being what's being placed upon them and when i met with an administrator recently and it was actually regarding behavior um but it, it still ties into what's going on within the schools so i asked what happened when when there's somebody who comes in to maybe they're new to the school maybe they're not and there's a constant behavior issue and she went through what the teacher has to do when there's a behavior issue and like, like you talking about the disciplinary the process. disciplinary process right and it was you know modeling behavior read by like by the time she was done i looked at her i'm like i'm exhausted just from listening to you that is not the teacher's responsibility to be doing that we have to be putting some of these things back on to the parents and so tying that into what's what it's also not the teacher's responsibility to be talking about gender and sexuality and all of these things in the schools, putting that burden upon kids um, who are just going there to learn reading, writing, math, and so on. And so we have to extract that from the schools and really return to traditional education where the kids get to go and they get to be kids and they don't have to worry about all of these other things that are going on. Um, and, you know, at Cocoa Pod, they've... <laughs> It, the cocoa Puffs is 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 an issue. They have a um, they have a uh, the, the sponsor of the gender Co sexuality. Cocoa Puffs is a middle school. It's a the middle school. Scottsdale school district. So we have an um, uh, the sponsor of the the GSA club there, who was awarded by Glisten. Glisten's a bit of a problem as well as a national organization that's that's uh, reaching out to schools to set up rainbow libraries and Glisten and GSA clubs and so on, but. It, this, so first week of school, this teacher, who's the sponsor of the club, says to her class, raise your hand if you don't want to be a member of the GSA club. Oh, boy. So it the kids are going home. sets you up to be home. the gay hater. If you don't You got to raise your hand to be the gay hater. Yeah. So, and it's sad because that's not why we send our kids to school. We want them to learn and thrive. And like we want to, we really want to um, develop students' interests not their identities. And that's why we send them to school, right. right? And so these kids are obviously going home telling their parents. And one of them said like, well, I think I went off to join the club, but they're gonna think I'm a transphobe, homophobe, whatever. And that's completely unfair right. to these students. Yeah. And- so, uh, they're sh so, so they're capitalizing on the goodness of our kids to shame them into compliance with this other stuff that makes it seem like and it's normal. It, it's terrible. And, and the thing is, Parents are pulling their kids out in droves. Teachers are living in droves. Our enrollment is down significantly. And uh, we will have new enrollment numbers coming up next week. And it, I'm kind of at the tip of my seat here waiting to see what those numbers are because um, 
as you know, a proponent of, a proponent of public schools, I want students, I want to raise our enrollment and fill our classrooms and fill our schools. And I want public schools to be that number one option, you know, help people to go to school in their neighborhoods. You know, and it, it makes life better. It does. But, but now, you know, people don't realize like Arizona's got this amazing, we're leading the nation in charter school mm -hmm. uh, options. And the Great Hearts Academy is absolutely pulling the best students out of Scottsdale School District because the most engaged parents who are the most concerned, who have the most means, they're yanking them out. They don't want them in the public school at all. And, and then it's everybody who's left. And it's a lot of parents who are either busy or they're like holding on hope or they're not as engaged and they don't get how bad schools have gotten. But if you want to, you know, the, the biggest, the end run on the teachers unions and the end run on these school boards, which are political positions and are, and are ruining our country, uh, the end run is being done on them with the the, the uh, charter school system. Yeah, and and in public schools, so if you have a child with special needs or who needs extra services, you need that public school because that's where you're, where your child is going to get those services. And not everyone has the resources to pull their kid and put them in a charter or a private and so on because it does change the dynamics of when they have to be there. It's driving. Up, yeah. It's, you know, you almost have to have a parent who stay home because yeah. they, they don't have buses. You know, they don't have all that transportation. The transportation is a big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. It's a, it's a very big deal. I can come to work early because my son can hop on the bus and get to school. Yeah. See, look at that. So, I mean, I have a huge, I value public schools. My kids go to public schools and I, you know, of all the dads, you know, I've probably been in the school more than most dads you've ever met because I go down there and push and I'm like, hey, what's going on? How come this is happening? Well, let me, can we meet with the dad? No, no, no. I don't want to talk to you. Don't handle me. Get the principal and I want to meet with the teacher. I'm I'm a I'm a pain in the ass about it because I I think the thing that makes school good is accountability. Parents looking, questioning, and everyone's going like, oh, well, I'm not going to get away with that. I don't want to deal with Mr. Medford when he hears what his daughter heard. Yeah, exactly. So and, and it's time to play offense. You know, it's really time to, for us to go in, ask school board members to um, to make sure that parents when they come in to have policies in place that when parents come in, that they are treated the way that I want to be treated, the way you want to be treated, you want answers, you want results, and to take action to rid the schools of this garbage that has come into it. Let me ask um, you a question. How many people are on the Scottsdale School Board? Five. There's five, and there are three lefties on it now. Mm -hmm. And two semi-conservatives. Correct. Okay, and you're running as a... Uh, Conservative. Well, Absolutely. I, well, I mean, you, you don't get to politically identify. You just put your name on the ballot, right? Just the names on the ballot. And that's why it's so important in these races that you do your research, um, reach out to the candidates. They should be willing to sit down and meet with, with you um, and check out their websites. And you want to know what their political affiliation is. Let me give um, a little, I, I want to take a little pause here and I want to talk to our audience just for a second. And then I want to jump into some of your examples and I want to get some advice from you for parents who can't just drop life and go run for a, a, an office in their town, what they can do, you know, that system pretty well, where can they nudge the needle the most? You know what I'm saying? Just as a parent. Um, I think it's incumbent as we get into the midterm elections and we're actually doing our voting, the most hyper engaged are the ones who've sent the, cadre of people that you're going to vote for they've, they've made it through this primary season with the most engaged people i think you're looking for two things right now well three things um republican or democrat for all of the um political offices and then on the republican side we now have a nuance and and we don't know how we haven't worked this out yet um, we haven't worked out the trump reform wing of the republican party versus the establishment mitch mcconnell voting for spending happy to make compromise on second amendment uniparty republicans who are who are the, the, the scourge of the earth because they're lying they're actually democrats so we have to find some way in in your election see if you can see who's running in your state and for the ballot you're going to get look at your choices and go through and see you, you know we want to we want to kick out the establishment. We want to bring in these folks who are willing to end corruption. If you're that kind of person. If you like the corruption, 
do the same old thing. And then the school boards and the judges, um, the ones that are really kind of obscure, all you have to do is see who's on the ballot before you vote so that you can Google them and find a little bit. Of, a little bit of reading goes a long way. You can just, if everyone read five sentences about the the down ballot folks each, you'd go, oh, it would change the landscape of the country because you'd go, there's a lot of accidental voting going on. There's a lot of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of name. Oh, I know that. I'm going to vote for them. They're, they must be good. I know them. There's a well, lot a of that. That's a pretty name. <laughs> you know. Because, you know, I, I'm super engaged and I don't know all of the races and all the people yeah. involved and I feel compelled to vote. So I just don't vote in areas where I'm not real positive or I'm sitting there in my voting booth with my phone reading about people going, okay, I like that. So back to the back to you now. Um, let's see some examples, um, some of these egregious things that you've brought in, and uh, we'll pull them up. So pull it out, hand it to me, and you talk about it while we look at it. Give me the, let's do the low-hanging fruit, the, the most nasty. All right, let's do this one. So real quick, my, my background is in finance. I was a lender for a greater part of 10 years while my husband and I formed a uh, real estate um, investment constitu uh, consultancy. And I bring that up because... I, having placed over $100 million in commercial and residential loans, I had to work with people that didn't necessarily see my point of view. I um, had people who counted on me every day. I recruited about 150 loan officers, created the most six-figure income earners inside of um, the company that I worked at. And when I got up in the morning, the decisions I made didn't just affect me. They affected the people that I employed and the people that who counted on me to to finish whatever transaction we started. So it gave me a certain skill set to create consensus where there may not be any, uh, like a school board where you have differing opinions. And you know, you see in the school boards right now, the three school board members are perfectly okay with what, it, what we're about to talk about. And so um, it, going back to the offense and, and being, you know, a lead, this is a leadership position and somebody who's willing to actually stand up and push back against this and putting policies in place so that we can actually get rid of it. So fire away with. So tell me about this one, because this is not, in my opinion, as provocative as the other one that I this saw. One? Well, they actually, kind of, they go together. So this is actually both from Desert Mountain High School. So this is from Desert Mountain, Scottsdale School District. This is an actual form that went out to the kids. It's a sexual orientation exercise. Yeah. So that was created. Uh, there was four Scottsdale Unified employees that created curriculum for the Anytime Unitown Club, which was promoted through Scottsdale Unified, and there's two high schools who actually have anytime, anytime clubs at their schools. This camp was a sleepaway camp in Prescott, and that was one of the assignments that the children, the children, the, the high schoolers would be given. Oh, so the high schoolers are at a sleepaway camp, then they find out if they're gay, and do they move all the gay kids into a, a special place? <laughs> or is, like, do the gay kids go into a pink place? A pink cabin and the straight kids go into a purple. Ca what happens? This is so sad. Um, so I'm just asking. I, know, I know I got the. Okay, like, okay, well, all the gay kids. We're gonna have you guys together. That's gonna be the fun room. What? Yeah. How does this go? So you know the the club itself is teed up as a leadership camp, and uh, a lot of the 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 exercises that they do is to be accepting and so on. And so that, that that's one of the ones that they do. I mean, they, I just want a hidden camera at this to see uh, this. Um, this sounds crazy to me. It is. And and what's sad is the other assignment, I have a picture of it, is, was called, and this is what they were talking about being really great. So the four staff members from Scottsdale Unified, there was a skit called Herman's Head. And that was um, uh, somebody has to be the main character. And then there was four other people who had to play a parent, a teacher, a student, whatever. And then they would have different parts. And so the main character would then be the one that's coming out either as trans or gay. And then the reactions would be the different characters. And one would be like very like angry and upset that they're doing this. And one would be supportive. But it ends with the main character pulling out a toy gun and killing themselves. You can look it up. And that is horrifying because that is, 
the fact that they're they're it's like putting it out there as this ideation of this is what happens if somebody decides to come out as something so they're doing an exercise that actually it's an interesting exercise if you have a group of people who are wrestling with this because you get to see people come with these stereotype reactions i imagine the characters make up their reaction one's the angry dad i can't believe you're gay one's the accepting aunt one's the teacher how everyone responds and then the character kills himself at the end based on the stereotype responses that they're trying to quell is that about right that's about right okay and the fact is is they're making and i see this in the communications around that this is this is I understand that, that 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 children are struggling with this. I get that, and that there's a, a the UCLA did a study in 2009. 0.6 percent of our population struggle with with gender dysphoria. It is a mental condition, and it should be treated by 0.6, so less than one percent. Yes, and um, this should be treated between a doctor and parents in our children, not the schools, right. not teachers, not so qualified. Like, they're not qualified, and and we need to. We need to take care of those kids because they obviously have an issue, just like uh, if somebody had cancer or but they had if, a, but anorexia. But if someone's got cancer, we don't do cancer treatment on the whole school. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm very supportive. And, I, I, and we shouldn't say cancer, but let's say someone's got a uh, club foot or they've got something. That's oh, just anorexia different. is another yeah, one, okay. eating disorder, right? Sure. sure. But, um, but the thing is, is, is I, I have compassion for all children. And we, when kids go to school, they should all feel included yeah. and comfortable, not be made to feel like the poor students in that Cocoa Pot class where they had to raise their hand if they did not want to be a part of a certain club. And so we want, and I want our schools to be a place where when the kids look forward to going to, where they can just go and learn and, and have positive experiences, not be just have this, this gender and pronoun and this, this whole thing being shoved down their throats. Yeah, this is, the, this is a bunch of wussy stuff. All right, request for, um, this is request for GLSEN to train teachers to use pronouns. Oh, so this is a request going out to the schools to get teachers to engage in this pronoun talk with the kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the letter being sent out basically requesting this be done district wide or something yep okay so it goes out to typically it goes to the whoever's the sponsor of their gsa club or if they can find a student leader inside and, of and that is gsa is that gay straight alliance is that what that yes, is now changed to uh gender sexuality alliance okay all right um let, let me see what else you have there let's see here all right this one is is just to listen wise this is uh the the uh oh okay so this is them talking about this is a teacher talking about gerrymandering and how basically it's a uh, form of white supremacy. Yeah, so this is in the current event. So this is the Savas curriculum that I was telling you about earlier. And when you go and you click on Listen Wise, which just like you would go to current events, this is what's there. They uh, praise um, Kenji, the, the latest uh, Supreme Court judge, and then they um, have concerns and fears around Amy Coney Barrett. So the difference it's it's all leftist and right. i don't have a problem with putting out there um her and kenji but let's make them Katanji, neutral. yeah yeah, Katanji, yeah. But, yeah 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 so I, i'm the same way i'm like you know katanji comes from this camp here's what you should know about her just like anton scalia comes from this camp here's what you should Absolutely. know about him but it shouldn't be caged and, and framed in the way that katanji is good for america amy comey barrett because she's catholic is bad for america exactly and well, gerrymandering it's funny um gerrymandering gets used as this they like to use these racial buzzwords about gerrymandering um and gerrymandering's turn into a big political tool obviously uh, and i think it's been used wrong at time, various times over the years but really gerrymandering is a way to capture like interests so people are represented better it's the mm -hmm. moving around for those of you who don't remember this from your civics class it's the changing of boundaries around election areas and it's done for a lot of different reasons. As communities expand and grow, um, as they change, if you've got a district that's very vertical and halfway through that district, it has a lot more in tune with its east-west instead of its north-south, they may break that district and say, this is a more hom homogenous district where well, it'll, it'll have a representation that's better for the group as a whole rather than one group disenfranchised within the other group constantly. So this is being battled out constantly. Yep. And it's not only, it's it's socioeconomic, it is racial, it has to do with policing and schools and all of it. I mean, gerrymandering is a big deal. It is a big deal. But it's not racist. Mm -mm. 
unless someone's doing everything based on race. Exactly. Right? It, it, it's a way of organizing us because we have to organize us somehow. We've got to put a label and put us in a box somewhere. But, but we got to make it about, but the school, instead of teaching that, they make it about racism. Like you can say, um, gerrymandering is the, and, and so let me think back to high school, okay? Gerrymandering is the moving of borders to change representative districts. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Pros and cons. Pros can be used to make districts more homogenous and represent the greater number of people more consistently. Cons can be used to racially isolate. Mm -hmm. Like the pros and cons of, these are the possibilities of both. Hey, in case you're on a gerrymandering local committee, these are the things you want to be aware of. But that's not what the definition of gerrymandering is. Right. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you know, and I noticed this too. The thing is, is like, it's very insidious because you kind of have to know your shit to spot that it's everywhere. And that's what I notice, especially, you know, I don't have TV anymore. If you watch TV, like if I'm traveling and I flip through the channels, everything is LGBTQ, everything. Like it's a high number of channels where if I just flip through and I go, I just listen for one minute. I go, oh. There it is. Yeah. I don't watch TV either. So. Yeah. Um, oh, let me see another one. Okay. Okay. So you did a FOIA freedom of information request for some paperwork that is consent so, tell me about this yeah so this was tied into um the the desert mountain um gal who is in charge of the gsa club there and i believe they actually accidentally attached that and so this was a communication from um for the hormone clinic right here in phoenix that was being sent to the librarian who is the um sponsor adult sponsor of the gender sexuality alliance club at desert mountain and when they were asked about it we've never gotten a response to to why they had that and they were trying to make up like oh a parent sent that in well i don't know at what school in today's age that a librarian should have that on their campus in high school so for those of you who can't see this which is everybody this is a patient patient registration form for hormone therapy through a local private medical facility here in town that a school librarian had who's running their gsa club that is correct so a after school club for the i don't know gay straight alliance whatever the hell they want to call it these days gender something what are sexuality they? gender sexuality alignment they've even changed that what about the just the gay and the straight people? They must feel like they've been hijacked. Totally. Now it's gender and sexuality. Um, and so they have a pamphlet here on ostensibly given to a public school person to be handed to a minor to deal with, quote unquote, some sort of medical treatment. And it doesn't require... A parent, a parent and I see it. It's his patient signature. It doesn't say parent. <laughs> it does not say parent. So this is the school in Scottsdale giving out a medical form to a minor to enter hormone therapy at a facility here locally that doesn't require a parent's signature. You can't go on a field trip to the Phoenix Art Museum without a signature from the parents. That is correct. You can't, parents can't come to school and go past the barricades without the thumbprint thing and yet they're going to let the kids do this with no parental involvement it's absolutely astounding to me kind of an uh unthreatening document until you dive in how it fits into what's going on you go holy yeah. shit well and and that's the thing you know when when parents are looking at their kids home and and to your parents look at your kids devices have them open up the chromebook for you or whatever device that they use and start looking around look at the assignments and so on and look at what's there and what happens is typically you have a little something of an assignment and you're kind of you know hum a little bit on it and then but then there's another one and you kind of piece things together and it's becomes this like death by a thousand paper cuts you know these yeah. little little yeah. digs and then you compound and you have a big problem and you know, the way students are leaving because of this. Right. Teachers are leaving because of this. I actually have a, a teacher who's become a friend who unfortunately left our district 
And he was not just a teacher. He was the volleyball coach, the track coach. So where did he go? He's in Cape Creek. Oh, good. I got him up in my district. <laughs> he's really good. Yeah. Um, but Is he high school or middle school? High school. And oh, really? We'll chat later. Okay. But what he was saying about, and, and he's absolutely against what's happening with this whole sexuality thing. And he's seeing in K through eight school, these cohorts mm -hmm. of people are now they're gay or now they're trans and they're so on. And it's like, it doesn't belong in our schools. So we we got to take it somewhere else. We saw this in the seventh grade and sixth grade with, um, with our, our daughter's friends, um, a big shift of them decided to go gay trans and went all pronoun nutty. And now they're doing, I mean, they're, they're really into it, but it's almost like it's a drug. It's almost like a group of kids that got into drugs and that group of kids does drugs together because I knew the kids when they were little and I knew them when they were adolescent and you know, 52 years here, I was a martial arts school teacher. I taught kids for years and years and years. I was always, I was never surprised by who came back gay after they were an adult and I knew them when they were a child. I was never surprised, not once. And it happened many, many times. And no and no problem, like, wonderful. That's totally okay. Love you, yes. I, I, I love that you're in the Navy now. I mean, you know, uh, I give them a big hug and, you know, congratulations. Um, but, you know, like Mr. Bedford, I just want to tell you, I, I, I saw a group of kids that all surprised me and now I hear what's going on with them. And, and, and people will say this is just conservative. I, I'm not a Christian coalition right-wing lunatic. I'm a pretty centrist, right-of-center constitutionalist. The kids now, they're doing drugs. I mean, I hear about it firsthand. They're absolutely doing drugs. They've got weird behavior. You see their pictures on social media, and they look spooky. Mm -hmm. There's something. There's like, it, and it smacks of mental illness to me. It does not smack of gender identity. And they're not on it now. It's changed. Boy, then girl, back to boy, back to girl, now smoking and then bringing pills to school. And I hear about it all. Yeah. There was a mom who came up to myself and uh, Amy Carney at an event. And it was outside. And we were sitting, and I get this, so we're sitting on a, on a sofa outside. And this woman comes and plops herself on the table in front of us in desperation, saying, I need your help. And she had sent her daughter to Cocopa, sixth grade. And um, by the way, Cocopa has a new principal. So I am hoping that that's going to be an amazing school in a few years. Um, so we're hoping we can uh, shift this whole thing around. But anyways, so she, her daughter joins the GSA club. And next thing you know, she's binding her breasts. And fast forward three years later, she's wearing a pin that says he, him. She tells her parents that... They don't love her because they won't affirm her as a boy. And this mother says exactly what you just said, though. It's like they're, they, they recruit each other. And because she hears her daughter talking to her friends and she'll say, oh, well, if you feel like that, maybe you're a chance. Well, maybe you should do this. So it's it's this thing like it's, it's almost, almost like, like a fad. It's like Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. It's Dungeons and Dragons, except it's penises and vaginas. The thing that's freaking me out about it is where is there room? Like, I don't want gay kids and trans kids who have this storm going on inside of them. But there was a kid in my junior high who had a little tiny head. His head was really small. The kid, there was no getting around. It was going to be a nightmare his whole life. He just had a tiny head. And I know he felt weird about it. The, what do you have a club around that and get everyone to start identifying as having tiny heads? And so they do this gay straight, the GSA club. I think the GSA club is a straight up indoctrination. It should be illegal. I think the club should be illegal nationwide. I think it's awful what they do because instead of promoting awareness, they promote mental health problems. And it's, it's a mental health crisis in my opinion. It is. And for the children that are really struggling with this, like we need to wrap them up and warm, you know, you, we, do, we need to protect them. We, we need, need to protect, protect them. them. Yes. And they're not being protected, right? They're being exploited. But let's not do this to all the other kids who exactly. were afraid to raise their hand and say, yeah, I kind of want to do the chess club. I really don't want to <laughs> do the gay club. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's, 
it's so crazy. We could, you know, probably talk for days. And I'm going to touch on security real quick. And it ties back into the parents and the division between our schools and our parents. And so I'm a firm believer you should have an armed police officer at every school. It just makes sense in the day that we're living in. In 2018, Scottsdale Unified did, they spent $10, $20 million on the securing of our schools, put up the bulletproof glass and one point of entry and so on. Um, but now that the, the, the recent shooting has now caused our, uh, caused our superintendent to say no more parents on campus because of security. And I think that is a complete That's crazy. And so are they allowing that to happen? That is happening right now. And I think that is wrong because I have not heard of one shooting or incident where, where the parents, parents involved. Yeah. So they're just using that as an excuse, like they'd use COVID to keep parents off campus. It's for their safety. You can't be against me. And then they give you the look, the eyes. It's for the kids' safety. Yeah. And and I'm completely opposed to it. And I think that we need to bring parents back onto campus. So are the kids going are the parents going bonkers? I haven't heard an uproar yet. Uh, but I'll I'm gonna check into that because they really the teachers need us. They need parents on campus. They need the helping hands. They screw, need access you know to eyes and ears. Screw the teachers. The kids need parents in the, place, not the teachers. Screw the teachers. The kids need them too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, you know, we just have to um, really just rein it in, take it back to a traditional education, and we got to put our kids first. And you know, it's like um, I when we put our students first. We put America first. Yep. Hey, listen, when sixth graders all know calculus in this country, there'll be time for a GSA club. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. In the meantime, if 80% of Americans are below grade in reading, writing, and arithmetic, stop with the goddamn shenanigans. Yeah. And in Scottsdale, it's funny you bring that up. They have not released the high school standardized testing for last year yet. That's not happening. I think it's after the election. Uh, but in 2021, only 8% 8, 8 of 10th uh, grade students at Coronado High School were proficient in math, and 49% at Desert Mountain, which is our highest performing school. And that's completely unacceptable. So less than half of the kids were performing on grade in 10th grade at Desert Mountain, top performing high school in Scottsdale School District. That is correct. Yet we've got time for the gay or the gender something or other sensitivity Group. sexuality yeah yeah the gsa club the gsa club right so we can protect half of one percent of people drive everyone else nuts and fail at the mission of building our society they forgot the cornerstone of liber liberalism john stuart mills the least amount of pain to the least amount of people you know do the least amount of damage there's always damage being done do the least amount right we can't marginalize the majority trying to enfranchise a tiny minority and that's what's going on and it's going on everywhere yeah that is that's a fact and uh so i i teach education classes uh, and we we put them together for parents it's amy carney and myself and we actually have one coming up on sunday where we show parents where to look in their kids devices and their chromebooks uh we teach them how to do public records requests so they can start you know seeing what's really going on behind the scenes and then we go over um just the things to you know things to look out for and we really are there because we want to support parents mm -hmm. and community members so it's not even just for parents anymore it's for if you're a taxpayer and you are living in our community yeah. you you should come and educate yourself and and join our community because um it takes all of us and we we literally are at a we're in a war for our children's minds mm -hmm. and it's going to take all of us to stop it you know it's fascinating and i uh i always i'm you know when i i i always try to listen to these discussions in myself through a liberal's ears and a liberal says well you just want to program them your way and we just want to program our kids our way and, and my answer to them is we actually don't want to program the kids all about sexuality we actually want to do reading, writing, arithmetic, computer science, history, and civics. That's actually what we want in school. And we really want them 
to have their morality from the example of their life and their family and we want them to make good decisions. We don't want them in the rabbit hole that you've put them in because of your theory because they're all based on theories. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and as we have these discussions, it's really easy to think, oh, there's, you know, we want to program the kids one way and it's them they want to program the kids the other way. And we're having a battle about who gets to program the kids. And I'm kind of going, you know what? I don't want to program my kids either. I'm not trying to brainwash my son to go in the Marine Corps and be a chest thumping lunatic conservative. Not at all. I, I want him to be a thoughtful, fair, and just young man better than me. That, yeah. That's all I want. Yeah, we want them to be critical thinkers. And, yeah. uh, you know, they've hijacked that too because critical thinking now it's is racist. It's racist. <laughs> and critical thinking is that you know you should accept that people can choose their gender and you you know that's that's the way they're leaning with critical mm -hmm. thinking when no critical thinking we want them to make sound choices for themselves and be able to be good contributing members of society and uh that doesn't mean that um uh if they don't agree with with the leftist agenda that they are you know non-critical thinkers they confuse opinion with math and science they do so uh they have oh that well that's your truth no nah, it's not really it's actually my opinion and, and, and yours is opinion but there's actually a truth so um the when is the election coming up november 8th november 8th and so if you're a scottsdale voter um where can someone go and support you so you can go to my website it is werner for susd.com so w-e-r-n-e-r f-o-r s-u-s-d dot com s-u-s-d dot com okay yep. i keep repeating it because you say it really fast and you're really used to it and everybody else doesn't catch oh, it w so um w-e-r-n-e-r-f-o-r-s-u-s-d dot com and my social media handles are uh werner for s-u-s-d with the number four so w-e-r-n-e-r -E -E the number four SUSD. SUSD, Scottsdale Unified School District, for those of you who are wondering what that means. So um, they can go there and help support you. What's the best way to support? V besides voting, s send 20 bucks, send 50 bucks, whatever. That would be fabulous. And you can do that on my website. Uh, donations are, are greatly appreciated and much needed. So. Um, I always laugh. I chuckle to myself constantly about the paradox of Scottsdale, where I grew up in Paradise Valley. So a couple of the most well-heeled zip codes in America. And I notice as the horse properties, as the horses diminished and the garages and the Porsches showed up, the voting and the cowboy hats, the cowboy hats changed from being grass working hats to felt big boy hats. And the voting has gone very, very centrist left a group of people who have benefited and suckled to the teat of capitalism and competition has gone Marxist on our watch in our own town and stolen it from us, which is why I, I moved to cave. I moved to carefree. Actually, they, they've gone centrist and liberal and it makes me sick to my stomach as they drive around. You know what it looks like driving around Scottsdale, like. Porsches, Audis, BMWs, all of these vehicles that everyone aspires to, aspirational consumption for success, and then they get there and turn into lefties, and it blows my mind. You'd think they'd be the most conservative in, Ar in Arizona. Then you go to the west side where everyone's driving Chevys and Fords and Hyundais, very conservative. Yeah. It's bizarre. <laughs> it is bizarre. It's bizarre. It, it, it is bizarre. And, you know, the, the district, when you listen to these board members and – leadership in our schools there's always this fear they put on the teachers and um when it comes to their funding you know we don't pay teachers enough or they um uh you know they, the school's just got a huge amount of new money coming into the schools and it's like well it still has to be approved in march and it's like well of course it's going to be stop trying to make these these poor teachers because there's a lot of good ones there's just there really is a small select group who wants this stuff that we've been talking about for the last however long that want this in the school yeah. most of them just want to teach their kids reading writing math and so on and um and so 
even while they're doing that fear mongering of the teacher's pay, they're spending money in all the wrong places. Right. And um, one of the things that like they spent $156,000 on social media marketing in Scottsdale. Didn't need that. Didn't need that because you cannot out market a parent's um, experience. Right. You can't market your way, your way out of right. that. You know, we have to get the student experience back, the, t the parent experience back the, so we can. The Marxists in this country think they have a messaging problem. Hmm. They're so arrogant. They, they, they don't go, oh, you know, we're, we're doing this wrong. People don't want this. They think they have a messaging problem. And the, the white, all, from the White House all the way to the school district. So what they did was they did they spent $150,000 marketing to tell us they're doing a good job while we're experiencing a bad job. That's exactly it. Right. Yeah. It's a they they literally think well, you know, they're burning down our neighborhoods and they think what they need to do is just change our glasses we don't see the upside of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's bananas. It, it is it is bananas and um you know it's it's it's, it's just time to peel that back and back to basics and you know fund our classrooms where the money belongs because the school has a lot of money and it just needs to go to the right places i've had this discussion with teachers too now do you know what the um money per student is between state municipal and federal dollars per student in public school you know i have that on my website broken down i think it's between 12 and fourteen thousand dollars. So, yes okay yeah and i was talking to some teachers who basically said, well, you, you, you know, you people don't pay us enough money. And I said, now, hold on a second. I go, you know, you've got an average of 28 kids in each class and they represent this much money per class. And the teachers looked at me, they were gobsmacked. I said, that's how much money there is per child in your classroom. And they're like, what, where do you get that from? I'm like, that's public knowledge. It is, yeah. And, and, and you can Google it. It's all over the place. And, and they're, well, you know, it's, ex I go, look, buildings don't cost that much. What does cost a lot are entrenched leadership people who make crazy amounts of money and don't do any teaching at all. And there's these superintendents everywhere. I don't know how many superintendents there are in the Scottsdale School District, but they get paid well. They do. And that's that's where a lot of the money is going. And then they're bringing in uh, like Scott Sell brought in uh, Camp Solutions to do their strategic plan. Well, a superintendent has the training and the tools to create their own strategic plan. And we spent about a, close to $100,000 on that already. And then they approved an additional 50000 for one of the school communities, which again, is ridiculous. They had tried to approve 100000 recurring for four years to the same company uh, on a consent agenda, which means that they don't talk about it. They just vote on it. But fortunately, one of the uh, board members pulled it out and they discussed it and reduced it to 50000 But again, it's completely unnecessary. And that money should be going back into the classrooms and to the teachers and, and so on. And, you know, the teacher that I talked about earlier um, that I'll, I'll have to connect you with, he made, he had a master's, he had all the bells and whistles and made about $55,000 and then was getting a doctorate and requested a bona fide raise. He was ignored, phone calls weren't returned, mm -hmm. and ultimately he got an ultimatum that said, sign your contract or turn in your resignation. And turn in his reg resignation for him. Well, you know, that's, that's the problem with these folks. Um, and uh, there's a bloat of administration in this country. Yeah. We see it in the medical field and we see it in, in, in scholastics a lot. There are way too many people making big money screaming about how there's not enough money for the actual people teaching. Yep. And that happened when our superintendents got his contract. That's not up until next June. Got it extended for three years. Got a 20% um, possible bonus raise. And the total contract for the three years or the contract extension ends up being almost a million dollars. And they can't take pay our effective teachers. It's it's absolutely horrifying. Right. And we need to fix that. Right. You take a million dollars, divide it by 10,000, and that's how many teachers didn't get a bitch and raise. I mean, it really is. Yeah. For somebody making 55,000 to go to 65,000, it's a big damn deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. Because it's a lifestyle change. You know, when you're making, you know, 150 and you go to 170, it's not a lifestyle change. It's a little extra money. Maybe you get a new car. When you're making 55 and you go to 65, 
you get a new neighborhood. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, look, thanks for coming in. I appreciate all you mama bears who've come up and your claws are up, and I hope you rip some throats out and make it right because uh, I really think that we're playing whack-a-mole on, and we're sh shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. I think mm -hmm. the only thing that's going to fix this country is fixing a generation of kids and kind of holding on to the republic, waiting for them to come along. Short of a revolution, I don't know how else we're going to do it. Nope, it starts with the kids. Thanks for doing your thing. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you being here. Say your website one more time so everybody gets it. Werner for S U S D dot com. Okay. And is that number four or F O R? You can use both. Oh, look at you. <laughs> All right, sports fans. That's the local that's the local goings on here. And some of the things that you're gonna be you know, you hear this stuff if you watch Fox News. You never hear it in the mainstream media because they're all behind this. This is part of George Soros, the Chinese Communist Party. It's part of the millions and millions and millions of dollars that have been spent bribing, nudging, pushing, swaying, and changing our nation by outside forces and communists. I grew up, we practiced some drills underneath desks, worried about nuclear blasts. I grew up training to fight a cold weather confrontation with Russians. I grew up with the phrase, better dead than red. And we've lost our way when we don't know who our enemies are and we let them into the hen house. It's unbelievable. That's the show. See you, sports fans.